Our next speaker is Anna Bohm. She's a master's student at Oregon State University researching microplastics in microcritters. Say that 10 times fast. She's gonna share how she went from being a Midwestern art student. So we're gonna travel from where Megan's from in, on the East Coast to the Midwest. Um, and so she was a Midwestern art student and she's transitioned to being a researcher collecting trash from underwater 200 miles offshore. So Anna, go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation. Thanks. Um, well, thanks for that introduction, Lindsay. Um, like she said, my name is Anna Bohm and I'm a master's student at Oregon State University in the Department of Fisheries and Wildlife. And today I'm gonna to share a little bit about my background and what led me to my research in microplastics. I grew up in Northern Illinois, which is about as far from any ocean as you can get, though I've always loved water and dreamed of the oceans. I thought I'd share some pictures of myself when I was in junior high to start our journey off um, from where some of you are at. I'm not sure if people still play truth or dare, but apparently my friends and I thought it was fun to dare each other to dress up in goofy outfits and run around the block. So that's what we did in the Midwest. Moving along, I've always liked working with my hands and spent some time working at Home Depot, where I learned all about different building materials, which proved really helpful um, starting in research. While working there, I noticed there were a lot of plastic bags piling up at the cashier stands and the returns counter, and I didn't like the idea of them filling up the landfills or seeing them floating around the parking lot. So I started to collect them. And there were so many, I just felt like I had to find a use for them. Um, before I found a use, my another friend and I thought it was fun to drive around and take pictures of a large bag of more bags. By now, I was in art school and studying painting and sculpture, and I decided to use the bags to make some paintings by melting them down with a blowtorch. Um, I definitely don't recommend doing this as they're very toxic when they're burning. And as you can see, I wasn't wearing the proper personal protection equipment. But my sister still has these paintings uh, hanging up in her house now. I eventually graduated from the University of Illinois at Chicago and traveled around teaching preschool, English, and art. And throughout it all, I was passionate about reducing waste at home and in the classroom and protecting the environment. After moving to Portland, I decided to return to school for a degree in environmental science and management at Portland State University. At Portland State, I began volunteering in the Applied Coastal Ecology Lab. And given my interest in waste, I quickly gravitated toward two women researching microplastics in coastal animals. On the left, Dorothy Horn is researching how microplastics affect organisms along the Oregon coast, like the mole crabs that you'll find burrowing in the sand on the beach. And on the right, Britta Beckler was researching how many microplastics are in different bivalves that we eat, like Pacific razor clams and Pacific oysters, similar to what Megan's researching. Both were researching microplastics, but what exactly are microplastics? Microplastics are a size class that includes any type of plastic between one micrometer and five millimeters, though there's a lot of variety in what that is. Um, up in the corner, I have a scale for reference. So five millimeters is about the diameter of a pencil eraser, and the average strand of human hair is 60 micrometers, so that means that the small end of the microplastics is 1 60th of a strand of your hair. So if you have a little piece of hair, you can take a look at it and um, see how small that is. Where do they come from? Primary microplastics are manufactured small like microbees in personal care products and abrasives or nurdles, which are melted down to make larger products. Secondary plastics are remnants from larger plastics, like microfibers from laundered textiles or fragments from degrading debris, or even tire dust particles from roadwear. 
One example is washing a fleece jacket um, actually releases about 250,000 fibers um, into the wastewater, which makes its way down to the ocean eventually. So why study microplastics? Well, plastic pollution continues to rise with millions of tons entering the ocean each year. We know that animals are ingesting the microplastics, but are still trying to understand how it affects them. This is hard to do since there are so many different types of plastics out there. At the same time I was volunteering with Dorothy and Britta at Portland State, I had the opportunity to volunteer on a 10 day NOAA research cruise and was invited to collect my own samples while we were out there. So I started looking into the research and seeing if there had been any research done um, in the area where the boat would be going, which you can see on the map here. And I didn't really find much, so I decided to collect samples while we were out for microplastics. We just talked about tons of microplastics being in the ocean, so I was interested in finding out whether or not animals are eating them and if some animals eat more than others. I decided to collect zooplankton to answer my questions. So here on the left is a picture of the boat that I was on. It's called the Bell M. Shimada. And then, as I mentioned, the map on the right is, um, includes all of the stations that we stopped at as the black dots. And it goes, went down as far south um, to just north of the Bay Area in California and up to 200 miles offshore. Having no idea what, I mean, I had never been to sea before and I had no idea what living on a boat would be like, especially for 10 days. Um, but I was definitely pleasantly surprised the science team was split into day and night shifts, so we both worked 12 hours, but we really only had to work when we were on a station, which is just the boat trying to stop at a point in the water. I, before I had left, I just imagined that there were kind of these buoys at every one of those dots out there, um, but it's more just they have coordinates and they just kind of try to hover around where we'll start collecting samples. and. Um, so what we did when the boat was stopped, we would collect water samples using the instrument shown on the left. It would drop down into the water and fill those bottles with um, water at different depths, which we would filter for nutrients and water chemistry. And we also collected plankton toes for zooplankton, like the one seen on the right. Um, and then anything else a researcher on board was there to sample. When we weren't working, we could sit on the flybridge and look for wildlife, exercise, watch a movie in the lounge, or grab a snack from one of the buffets. It was really pretty sweet, and I was fortunate that I didn't get seasick and that we had good weather and calm seas the whole time. Um, but we still had a job to do, and mine included collecting zooplankton for microplastics. Well, I keep mentioning zooplankton, but want to make sure that we're all on the same page as to what I'm talking about. So zooplankton actually translates to animal wanderers, and it just means any weak swimming animals that drift around in the water. So this includes larval fish, crab, mollusks, jellyfish, copepods, krill, and many more. I chose to study zooplankton because they're an important food source for larger animals like salmon and whales. They feed where microplastics accumulate, and they're common laboratory test organisms, making them useful for future microplastic studies. The zooplankton were collected on the boat using a bongo net, named that because the top of it looks like a bongo. You can see it's got those two big round um, openings. It's dragged through the water, and then the contents are stored in jars like the ones you see pictured. So those jars also show how different a sample can be at a different station. The ones on the left are more green, which means they have a lot of phytoplankton in them. And the ones on the right are more pink, which means they're filled with healthy fat krill, which is a great food source for other animals. Back in the lab, I sort the samples under a microscope, separating them into the major zooplankton groups shown. Most of what I see are ketonaths, krill, copepods, amphipods, larval fish, and crab megalope, which is an early stage crab. I also see larval squid and other cool critters, but not often enough to use them for my project. 
The separated groups are then digested to eliminate the organic matter so that we can see what's inside. And this is my setup working in the lab. Um, I've been very fortunate that I've been able to continue my research in the lab during COVID um, because it requires using this really clean hood that all my work has to be done in to make sure that I don't get any microplastics um, contamination. So I digest the samples and then I vacuum the remains using the vacuum system set up inside there. And I look at the filter under the microscope and just basically look for anything that looks like plastics. And if I find things, I, I separate it out and I take pictures of it. And then later those pieces are run through a machine which tells you the composition of the material. When I'm not working, I like to explore underwater. I usually take a bag with me to collect any trash or other treasures I find, um, but specifically the trash so that it doesn't break down into the smaller pieces. On this dive, I found some sea urchins using marine debris to armor themselves. They typically use shells and algae to do this as a defense mechanism, but it looks like they'll use whatever's around. Another problem with marine debris and microplastics, sorry, marine debris and animals is that it can be confused as food by animals. Um, you can see that the jellyfish in the plastic bag floating near each other would be pretty hard to distinguish for a predator. I also get to see a lot of animals that I normally wouldn't on land and learn more about who lives in our near shore waters. This is a video that I took while diving in Depot Bay and saw a purple sea urchin, a large sea lemon, black rockfish, and a lot more. And lastly, I just have some pictures of a couple favorite um, little guys that I see while diving. There's a sea cucumber. I always love seeing nudibranchs, some jellyfish, um, the copper rockfish I think are really beautiful, and abalone and sea stars. Um, I just love going in the water because you never know what you're going to see and it's different every dive. Um, that's all I have. So if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I also wanted to Thank everyone who has helped me get to where I am, including everyone on the Shimada who's helped with a uh, collection and my parents who are the ones in Central America, right now, or uh, Central United States listening in right now. Thanks. Fantastic, Anna. Thank you so much for sharing your path and a little bit about your research. We have a couple of questions. I'll speak slowly so you can enjoy your water. Uh, <laughs> so we have a question from um, Joel. I think this is in reference to when you were collecting bags back as an art student. So this was earlier on in your presentation, but you could potentially answer this over time if you like. How many plastic bags did you collect? So I'm thinking this was this was asked when you were talking about collecting plastic bags younger, but I'm sure you could potentially also answer this as to up until this point as well. Yeah, I. Definitely never counted them. Um, it was it was just too many to count. Um, as you could see in that picture, you know that bag was about the size of half of a person, and it was um, really thick. So, and I was just filling those up whenever I could, um, and was trying to take them into different recycling places that would collect plastic bags. But it was usually just too too many for places to take. So I definitely didn't burn all of them because that would be bad for both my lungs and the environment. Um, but unfortunately, I didn't count, so I don't know. I'm sorry. It's fair to say <laughs> that it was too many to count. <laughs> um, and we have a question from Clifford. So how do you find and count the microplastics if they are so small? So you briefly touched about this, but if you want to just go ahead, this was asked probably before you got to that, but just to reinforce that, sure. how do you find and count them if they are so small? So um, like I had mentioned in my slide showing kind of my laboratory setup, um, I've filtered through what I'm looking and I vacuum filter that. And then I take the filter and look at that under a microscope 
And so it's really just using a microscope to look to see if there's anything there. Um, and we're using a stereo microscope so the magnification doesn't get very high. I mean, it gets up to 40 times is the maximum that I use. But I do know that there's a lot of research also being done on nanoplastics, where, which are the next size class down and they have to use um, a regular compound scope to look for the plastics. So, but yeah, I use a microscope. Very good. And just to clarify, you made a, one thing I wanted just to clarify is you said something about you have to, you gained access to the Marine Science Center so you could do your research because you have to use a special hood. And you talked about contamination. So just as an example, just to clarify, if you're wearing like a fleece sweater or something that has microfibers in it, you're, you're trying to reduce the amount of the things that might be on you or in the air or in the environment getting into your samples, correct? Yeah, there's just so many floating around um, that when I'm working, that, that hood that I'm working in, it's blowing air out so that um, no air from the environment around it can come in and contaminate my sample. And then I also wear 100% cotton with 100% cotton lab coat um, and everything's wiped down with ethanol. So there's a lot of steps that are taken to try to reduce um, contamination from plastics that are just constantly kind of floating around the air that we breathe. <laughs> right. Thank you for clarifying that. And so, of course, this is probably a common question. How long does it take for plastic to break down? And I'm sure that could be dependent upon what we're talking about. But in general, how long? Yeah, it definitely depends on the type of plastic and a number of environmental conditions. So um, wave action and sunlight can both increase uh, how quickly a plastic breaks down so or if the water is warmer versus colder but I mean plastics are built to last indefinitely so you know it could be thousands of years it could and it could be hundreds of years it just also kind of depends on what you mean by breaking down because they don't actually ever fully break down they usually just break into smaller pieces um, so until they you know just become smaller and smaller Yes, very good thing to clarify is plastic te technically never really goes away. It just gets smaller and smaller. And so kind of on that same, is there a way, so we all, we like to recycle, we like to reuse, right? And so are there ways to harvest or recycle microplastics? So if we're finding microplastics and removing them or what have you, I know you're just counting them in your samples, but is there a way to kind of recycle them in a way? I know that's kind of a, take. can we take a bunch of microplastics and... <laughs> And, and find a way to harvest them for other sources or other things? Um, I mean, I'm sure that there could be something. I think maybe part of the problem would be that a lot of them come from our different types of plastics. So, you know, it might be hard as far from a manufacturing standpoint to put a lot of different types of plastics together. Um, they would have different melting points. And, and so if you were to try to melt it down to make a larger item, I could see that being problematic, um, but also harvesting them is really hard because they are so tiny. I know um, you guys do a lot of work with marine debris and you know going out and doing some sifting in the beaches and there's definitely a lot of items that pop up, but you know most of it is probably still falling more in the macro range. So uh, again, if you're looking for stuff that's about the thickness of your hair, um, they're just, I think, hard to harvest. Very good point. Thank you for your insights on that. I appreciate your comments on the different melting points and it's a little bit more complex than we think. So I appreciate your answer on that. Um, so we have a question from Ms. Medina's classroom. We have students from classrooms that are joining, by the way. Um, so uh, there's several nonprofit organizations to save the ocean, like for ocean. Um, to do like a cleanup. If you buy a product, they say they will clean a pound of garbage for the sea. Are you familiar with the, the Four Ocean nonprofit? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, do we have anything like that, like local to Oregon, so students or others can participate that you're aware of? Um, not that I know of off the top of my head. I know Oregon Sea Grant, you guys have your marine, marine debris educator program that where you teach educators on um, different ways that teachers can incorporate it into their program, but you might know better than I do about a local four ocean. 
Either of you? Yeah, so I think it, it would probably most likely be Solve uh, participants that we've heard of Solve or potentially Surfrider Foundation, which is not. So Solve is specific to Oregon. Surfrider is or there's Oregon chapters, but there's also other West Coast chapters or other coastal chapters or state chapters, I should say. And then there's also Coast Watch. Um, we can drop those into our chat. Maybe Kate can drop that into the chat as I'm saying this out loud. Um, so we just figured we'd also ask you as well, Anna. Fantastic. Um, still skimming through, we'll see, let's see, we probably have time for maybe two more questions if that's okay. Um, there was a great one from Sydney away. So you were originally an art student, right? And so is there a way that these students could incorporate art into their marine science related goals? So any comments on how to incorporate art into science? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of different ways you can incorporate it. Um, for one, I think, you know, it can be a really powerful tool for um, giving a delivery for your work or basically, you know, making attractive presentations or posters that uh, more people can want to look at or, you know, just interact with um, as far as like actually bridging art and science together. I also just think that using art as a, um, sorry, I just saw something come up on the chat. Um, I also just think that using art as a hobby or science as a hobby, like, you know, either side, I just think it is really nice to have a balance of both art and science in your life because it kind of can give your, your brain a break from one and do something different. And I think that, that can help uh, open up new avenues for in either area. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I completely agree with that and second that. So the other question is, um, sorry, there's so many great questions coming out. I just lost track of the one I wanted to ask. So thinking about your time spent on research vessels, um, what you mentioned that you did some exercising, which I got to say doing yoga on a boat, I think I, I, I get seasick. So I am impressed with anyone who can do that. So I uh, just a couple more what there was a question about what you do other than research. I think you showed some photos of like, uh, some places to watch TV. So things that you might do when you get, I think in air quotes, bored, because I don't think you can be bored on a, a ship, can you? Or can you? Um, there's a lot of downtime. And so, but I also think, you know, it probably depends on your personality a little bit. So there, there is a lounge where they have a couple hundred DVDs that are Navy DVDs. So it's, it includes a lot of movies that haven't been released yet, which is kind of fun. Um, there's also technically a gym on board that you know you can do um, a treadmill or like lift weights. But I mean, I just really like sitting on the flybridge and you know looking for different animals, watching the birds, seeing dolphins. I mean, there's always stuff going on. And at the same time, a lot of the downtime I would use to update my notes from you know that I've been taking on collecting my data. Um, so just reading more research, just using the time somewhat as I would at home, but then also, you know, taking some time and enjoying the outdoors too and just being on the water. Fantastic. And to a combo question of what's your favorite type of zooplankton and um, what, um, hold on. So yes, what's your favorite type? Let's just end on what's your favorite type of zooplankton? How about that? Or planted. Really hard. Um, I think they're all really cute, but I do have a special place in my heart for copepods for whatever reason. Um, those are just little torpedo shaped bodies, but they have these beautiful long antenna that um, usually have these red tendrils at the end that are kind of fiery. And I don't know, I just think they're really cute. So. <laughs> and what do you hope to do when you graduate? What would be your ideal goal or your ideal job? I'd like to stay working in research, um, I, but I would ideally I'll have a job where it blends pretty much my whole past. Um, I like doing outreach. I like education. You know, I've taught for a long time, so I would like to have a component of that in my job, but I also really enjoy doing research. So I'd like to have a blend of a lot of different things. So. Thank you so much, Anna, for your presentation. And thank you participants for all of your great questions. If you still have some questions for either of our presenters, feel free to continue to type those in the chat. So thanks again, Anna.